Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to Pediatric Grand Rounds. We are going to start with a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge the Ramaytu Shaloni people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramaytu Shalon elders, past, present, and future who call this place the land that UCSF sits upon their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramaytu Shalon community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. And I would like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Bonnie Tomraz, uh, who is Associate Professor of Clinical Pharmacology and the newly inaugurated uh, Director of Pharmacogenetics at UCSF School of Pharmacy. He completed his PharmD and clinical practice residency at UCSF and UCSF Medical Center. And following residency, he pursued a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacogenomics at the Institute for Human Genetics at UCSF. His interest and work are in the field of pharmacogenetics, uh, research and clinical practice. The human genome was completed in 2003 when he was in pharmacy school. And at that time, he had a better appreciation of variation in response to medications and wanted to learn the role genetics plays in creating the observed variation. A small project with Dr. Les Bennett related to genetic variation and its impact on PGP drug transporter function sparked that interest and started him on the path that he has been on. He's here today to discuss the May 9th launch of the clinical pharmacogenetics program at UCSF Health, where he has played a leading role. UCSF Health is now the first hospital in California to implement a clinical pharmacogenomics program. And so it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Tom Ross to Grand Rounds. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, um, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, understand I have a large, there's a large audience on Zoom. So if you have any questions, obviously feel free to reach out to me after the meeting or during, at, or at the end too. So um, uh, my name is Bonnie Tamraz and uh, my primary area of interest is clinical pharmacogenomics. And today I'll be talking about the implementation uh, that uh, we just started. I do have a, I wanted to disclose, I do have a, uh, uh, I'm a scientific advisor for a company called Codex Genetics um, and that's in this particular space but nothing that I'm talking about here is related to any of the work that they do. So just wanted to disclose that. Um, so in terms of learning objectives are to identify, by the end of this, hopefully you'll be able to identify medication and classes of medication with clinically actionable pharmacogenetic information, discuss challenges associated with wide use of clinical PGX, describe the UCSF clinical pharmacogenetic program, and most importantly, at the end, this is the, this is the this is the part that I'm really interested about. Is that hopefully you'll be you're interested in integrating and implementing pharmacogenetic in your clinical practice. Um, so I'll start with some background information. So prescription drug use is prevalent, and percent of persons in U.S. using prescription drugs uh, in the past 30 days, and this was a 2019 stats, were like almost. 50% of the population in the United States is using some type of a medication. 24% use three or more different medications. 12.8% are on, on five or more different meds. And these are CDC numbers, again, 2019 stats. 71.9% of physician office visits involve some type of a pharmacotherapy and most frequently prescribed therapeutic classes are identified as analgesic and uh, anti-hyperlipidemic agents. And uh, we know that response to medication is variable. And there was a study published in 2011. It's, it's this really cool graph that shows that the response rates varies across uh, across the range for different therapeutics. And this, this, the response can be anywhere from, uh, you know, and this is the efficacy rate, anywhere from 25 to 80%. So there's a lot of variation. And this variation is a source of problem. One of it is adverse drug reaction. They represent a significant public health problem. 
to patient care. It's identified as the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, more than 100,000 deaths in hospitalized patients. And uh, ADRs pose a, a significant uh, financial burden, uh, 2.4 billion cost of ADR to health system annually. Again, these are estimates. And then uh, this is a 2018 publication that I've cited in here reported that uh, $528 billion annually are, uh, are associated, uh, are, is the cost of non-optimized medication therapy. And um, uh, we know that drug response is complex. Many factors contribute to that. These factors include environmental factors, uh, physiologic factors like age, disease, weight, um, uh, pregnancy, gender, uh, drug interactions, and biologic factors. So biologic factors including genetics, microbiome, metabolome. So um, again, I, I want it's important to put things in perspective. You know, we, I'm talking about genetics, but genetics is one of many factors that impact that uh, that medication response, and ultimately, that sound clinical judgment is critically important. Uh, in assessing the risk associated with using um, uh, pharmacogenetic information um, uh, to tailor pharmacotherapy. Um, and so pharmacogenetics, I mentioned this, um, uh, you know, it's the science of applying genetic gen or genomic technologies to determine the effect of relevant inherited or somatic genetic variation on drug behavior and response. And I underlined inherited because all the work that uh, I'll be talking about today it's related to inherited. These are germline variants that we acquire, nothing somatic uh, like cancer. Um, so, um, so I wanted to distinguish between those two. And um, I wanted to give a, a quick historical perspective uh, and, and early observation on inter-individual variation in drug response actually goes back to um, early 50s, where you know technology was developed to distinguish between different, uh, to separate the, between different uh, uh, closely related, functionally different proteins, and associate the changes in metabolism to uh, to drugs. And there were three uh, drugs that were uh, studied in that scenario. Succinylcholine was one. Primaquin and isoniazid, and the reason I put this again, it, it's an introduction that you know this genetic very. We started learning about the, the, the effect of different proteins on metabolism of these drugs, but the isoniazid case is interesting because um, uh, you know the 1960 pub that I have in there by Evans, it actually looked at uh, peripheral neuropathy and acetyl transfer. You know, looking at different polymorphisms or different functioning in acetyl transferases. But in that study that, in, that had 291 uh, subjects, 82 of them were under 20 years old and 57 were under 12. So it included like, a, you know, a pediatric population. And what's important uh, and, uh, is that in the conclusion of that study, the author does write, what's important for adults is also important in children at that point. So which is, is, is an important uh, recognition at early on at that point. Um, and um, and some of this work uh, also led to this, uh, uh, I would say, a, a pharmacogenetic principle, that is, phenotypes are observed upon exposure to a particular drug or chemical. So meaning that a genetic polymorphism can be there, we all carry these, but it doesn't mean they are uh, pathogenic, they, they cause disease. They're only the effect of those variants are observed only when we're exposed or to um, to a drug in this case. Um, there are different types of genomic variations, you know, we're, we're polyploidy, uh, so sort of triploidy, which is incompatible with life, aneuploidy, trisomy 21 is an example of that uh, for Down syndrome, gross segmental rearrangements, uh, you know, in cancer, you see this, uh, and, uh, you know, BCR able uh, uh, transformation is one uh, example of, uh, which is we're seeing in chronic myositis leukemia. Then we get to segmental duplication, copy number variation. An example of a gene that's affected by that is CYP2D6, and that's one of the genes that we study. Um, there are different copy number variations. Insertion deletions are also uh, other types of variation. UGT1A1 is one of the genes that is, again, of interest to us with respect to pharmacogenomics. There's an insertion of a TA uh, base in the tata box in the promoter region that alters the function. But by far the most common types of variations are single nucleotide polymorphism. 
and these are single base changes. They're very, they're very common. And there are at least more than 300 million known single nucleotide polymorphisms out there. So we're only tapping into a fraction of these for, the, for, the, for our PGX work. Um, these uh, phar these uh, pharmacogenetic variants um, are very common. There have been several studies that have looked at that. The, the largest one was published in 2020. It's a, it, it came out of UK Biobank where they looked at the, uh, the genetics of almost half a million people uh, for 14 genes that we know have actionable pharmacogenetic variants. And it was reported that 99.5% of individuals had at least one actionable pharmacogene variant. And uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead. And there was a similar study in, uh, out of Hong Kong that was published in 2021 that showed that 99.6% of individuals had at least one actionable pharmacogene variant. And the number in the bottom, these are our UCSF patients. You know, I, this, these are, I, I looked at 159 individuals that we've genotyped since the launch. Um, uh, and, and, um, um, and all these individuals, 100% of them had at least one actionable pharmacogene variant. Which is um, which is important to know. Um, so uh, I will say that most of my talk, and most of unfortunately, the science that we talk about is developed in adults. Um, and so uh, some of the numbers that I'm throwing at you that have been showing you, these are all adults uh, patients. But we did participate in a study that was published in 2020 that was looking at the prevalence of uh, uh, use of medications that have actionable pharmacogene variants in pediatric population, like individual, and this is, the pediatric population was defined individuals that had age, uh, that were less than 21 years of age. And UCSF uh, was one of 16 sites that contributed data to this particular study. We found that almost three, that we had about 3 million uh, uh, you know, participants in this study from 16 different sites. And, uh, we found that at least eight to 10, anywhere from eight to 10,000 out of 100,000 patients were <laughs> in this population were prescribed a medication that had uh, actionable CPIC uh, pharmacogenetic guidelines. Um, and and um, so um, I've cited the paper in here. There's lots of it's, it's, it's summary statistics. Uh, I've, I picked one in here, just shows that. Uh, a lot of different drugs that fall uh, across different therapeutic categories are used, and you can see that the prevalence of these. Um, so, uh, I'm, you know, I, uh, when I think about pharmacogenetics, what is the status of the field? I would say that there exists a large and growing body of knowledge associated with clinical pharmacogenetics. Technological advances in DNA sequencing, genotyping, and computers drive this PGX demand. There are good pharmacogenetic resources out there. There are tools that can help clinicians interpret the genetic data. Uh, and there are challenges to the wide use of PGX. I mean, uh, so, and I'll touch on that. You know, human genome was sequenced uh, uh, in 2007, and then, I'm sorry, in 2003. So this is the 20th uh, anniversary of that milestone. Um, and FDA started incorporating pharmacogenetic information in the package insert in 2007. And, but pharmacogenetics is still limited primarily to large academic centers. I've listed a few in there. Obviously, UCSF is joining that rank this year. And, and the reason for that is um, uh, we have uh, our healthcare system is fragmented. You know, fragmentation of our healthcare system limits linking results with future care. I've learned that there are 800 different electronic health record systems out there. I mean, that's a staggering number. How do you transfer information between these systems? It's a challenge. Education is a barrier. Uh, guidelines. So uh, there is, a, you know, the, uh, the professional society, we, we have limited guidelines. Professional societies haven't endorsed use of pharmacogenetic testing. Um, again, due, due to, uh, uh, you know, citing of limited evidence. PGX test itself is questioned because there is no standardization. I've heard uh, statements like, oh, FDA hasn't approved this kind of testing. Um, and our healthcare system doesn't really emphasize prevention. We're mostly reactive. Limited or lack of cost effectiveness data, that's a major barrier. 
payer restrictions, um, not getting paid for these tasks um, uh, or not being adequately covered. It's a major barrier. The turnaround time on the test is slow. Like our turnaround time is two weeks. You have a patient in there, you wanna start the medication, that two week is, is a barrier. Uh, limited clinical utility data, bioinformatic challenges, I kind of touched on that, like getting this information from the lab all the way to the provider um, is, is challenging. And I would say from a pediatric perspective, pharmacogenetic, you know, the, there's an additional challenge in, adi in, addition to, in addition to the items, the challenges that I mentioned is that PGX research is focused primarily on adults and potential pediatric benefits is mostly extrapolated from adults. And you'll see statement like this. This is an example for CYP2C19, for CYP2C9, which says like CYP2C9 activity is fully mature by early childhoods. These recommendations, these are some of the CYP2C9 drugs. Uh, these recommendations in adults, meaning may be appropriate to extrapolate to adolescents or possibly younger children. So you see this kind of extrapolation of data and that um, to, for pediatrics. Um, in terms of level of evidence, um, I, I did a survey. This was a couple of years. We published it a couple of years ago. I wanted to understand, do a needs assessment of our clinician here at UCSF. And, um, and I'm sharing a couple of points in here and which is like, I, you know, the survey was sent to clinicians and pharmacists alike across these different uh, uh, services. And, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, picking cardiology as an example in here. When asked, have you used pharmacogenetics in the last 12 months of eight cardiologists who completed this? The answer was no. Are you interested in it? All of them said yes. But when you ask, is observational data okay? And only half of them says so, say that observational data is sufficient. And this is something that's, a, 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 that's something that you see across different services and across the uh, professions where, um, you know, most of the uh, data that we have for pharmacogenetic is observational. We don't have randomized clinical trial that shows, uh, um, you know, pharmacogenetic has benefit for a specific gene uh, and drug pair across different uh, medications. Cost effectiveness, um, you know, cost is a barrier. It's one of the ma major barriers to implementation. Data is available, and I've picked some of these drugs in here, uh, but there is a lot of variability in, in cost and uh, in, in showing benefit. Like warfarin, I'm picking that as an example. There's, there's like one study that shows that uh, the use of genetic is cost saving. Uh, the, there are a couple of studies that show it's cost effective. There are a few studies that show it's undetermined, can't figure it out. And there is one study, there are a series of studies that are in brown on top. They show that it's not cost effective. So when you see information like this, how do you decide um, to, you know, uh, to you, this is going to be cost ben beneficial? So that is in itself is challenging. And um, uh, there are like, uh, to my knowledge, there were a couple of studies that have looked at panels like we're doing and, and, and looked at clinical benefit and uh, uh, potential cost benefits. These were both done in long-term care facilities and they showed that, uh, you know, that there were some clinical benefits, but also there was some cost savings. So uh, the Altia DX study that shows there was 621 per patient annual saving, the U-Script system with Utah showed like there was a $218 cost savings. So there was some cost benefit saving, but that data is limited. And one of the challenges also that we see is the information across different resources that we have is not consistent. So if you, as an example in here, if you're looking at simvastatin and SLCO1B1, so, and if the patient has a SLCO1B1 star 5 alone, if you look at the package insert, there's no recommendation. In fact, you will not find any SLCO one one information in that package insert. Uh, CPIC, which uh, is the Clinical Pharmacogenetic Implementation Consortia, it has recommendation. Obviously, those are the recommendations that we're following. I'll get into that in, in a moment. Lexicom, source that we use, it says, due to an increased risk of myopathy, consider a lower dose for patient, you know, 20 milligrams for patient with and they provide this RSID number. So this is a, you know, this is associated with the SNP that results in that star five. So that information is challenging because you have to make the connection that that's the variant that is associated with that star five 
is also uh, is the same variant that has that uh, uh, that SNP ID. If you look at the FDA has a PG a pharmacogenetic table. This is what they say. This is 521 TC and 521 CC. Uh, you know they result in higher systemic concentration and higher adverse reaction, and the risk of adverse reaction myopathy is higher for patients on 80 milligram than for those on lower doses. And then Micromedix doesn't mention anything. So, you know, faced with all of this information, again, it's hard to translate this and, and use this information. And then lastly, before I get into our program stuff, is that pharmacogenetic testing, there was a paper that was published earlier this year in The Lancet. It's a European study that, had, that was looking at 12 gene panel for 42 medications and about 7,000 patients, half of them were genotype guided, the rest were not. And they, should, they reported that the, uh, a 30% reduction in incidences of adverse effect across the groups over a 12 week uh, follow up period, which was an, uh, this is an, um, this is a huge uh, um, effect that they're reporting. So, um, so it's, it's very, uh, it, it's, it's, speaks to importance of using pharmacogenetics. So with all that introduction, so I'm gonna jump into our UCSF pharmacogenetic program. So we started um, a multidisciplinary team, kicked off this project two years ago, September, 2021. Our teams have met weekly, day, you know, I say weekly in there, but I was involved in various aspects of that. I feel like we were meeting almost every day, working on determining what drug gene pairs to target, that building our electronic health record system, setting up our lab, and obviously creating educational content and many, many other details. So we, you know, our team has worked very diligently over this period to uh, set up all these different events. Um, again, I wanna overemphasize that this was a multidisciplinary effort. Um, and uh, uh, for the, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and then, uh, we engage stakeholders. So for the uh, for the medications that we've selected and genes, we reached out stakeholders across all these different um, <coughs> excuse me different uh, different specialty. So this uh, this program was not kind of developed. It was not developed in a vacuum. So there were a lot of people that were engaged and we were soliciting input. There were uh, 34 leaders across various services were engaged. 18 different stakeholders meeting and discussions have been held. And, uh, um, and I've, uh, you know, we've had eight different Q&A sessions um, uh, when we went live, um, uh, and which I hosted, and clinicians were coming in and trying to, I was trying to answer questions. But overall, my sense is that there's an overwhelming support for instituting pharmacogenetic testing at UCSF based on that uh, engagement that we had. <coughs> Excuse me. So in terms of identifying drugs and genes, so um, FDA is one source. There are at least 335 meds, um, uh, therapeutic dr drugs that FDA has on drug gene interactions. About 115 are oncologic, 220 were non-oncologic. And then we also relied on CPIC, uh, which is Clinical Pharmacogenetic Implementation Consortia. It is an international consortium of experts in pharmacogenetic and medicine that is committed to use of pharmacogenetic tests to improve patient care. They review, uh, you know, they have experts that review literature and publish specific guidelines. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we relied heavily on these guidelines and FDA in order to come up with our list of drugs. CPIC, when they publish their list of medication, their recommendations, they assign them different level of confidence. So level A drugs are uh, recommendations for which they say, if genetic information is available, this information should be used for prescribing. And level B drugs are the ones that they say, if genetic information is available, that information could be used for prescribing uh, because alternatives can be as effective and as safe. So we did not look at level C or level B drugs on this list. And based on all the discussions and interactions that we've had, this is the list of medications that <clears throat> we came up with. I'm going to take a break while you're looking at this. Have a sip of water. <laughs> Excuse me. So these are the drugs that we were interested in. So... <clears throat> Um, excuse me. So we went live with all of these drugs except the HLA. HLA is coming up uh, pretty soon. 
but these are the medications. <clears throat> 62 drugs, 17 genes that we are of interest to us. Like I said, HLA is coming up next. Um, and uh, these medications, the 62 medications and the 335 uh, meds that FDA has information, uh, they fall across various therapeutic areas and you can see them listed in there. The numbers in parentheses refer to the medications that are on the UCSF list and the, the corresponding therapeutic area. So oncology, you have seven drugs that FDA, you know, FDA has 115, we have seven or psychiatry, there's 16 of the 35 that have that information uh, and the package insert are on our list. But not every medication <clears throat> has information in the package insert. Um, and, but it's on, but they have, some of them have uh, CPIC guidelines. So <clears throat> example of these are the ones that are listed in here. Uh, so all the statins, for example, they do not have any information in the package insert with regards to pharmacogenetics, but CPIC does publish this. So again, the information is not, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't overlap very well, but this, you know, but it's still there. So for 62 drugs, <coughs> excuse me, 118,663 patients were prescribed. <clears throat> My voice is gone. Give me one second. Sorry. Sorry about that. So uh, these medications were prescribed to 118,000 patients at UCSF in 2020. These are unique patients. Um, so there's, there's a high volume of usage. <clears throat> And of those 118,000, 14,692 were patients that were under the age of 21. Again, for looking at these 62 medications. Um, and uh, so we went live on May 9th of this year with 56 drugs and 15 genes. Um, there was a lot of press uh, attention that, was that we received. Now, because we have um, uh, about 118,000 patients that were on them, um, that, that, um, uh, uh, that were prescribed these medications that we had. And our capacity initially as we went live was to, uh, that we could genotype about 5,000 patients a year. So we had to kind of uh, control that, you know, because we couldn't genotype as much as we'd like to genotype every patient. Um, you know, we, we could not do that. So we selected the medications that are in red in here as <clears throat> initial, that drugs that when they are ordered, you see an alert fired in Apex that will remind the clinician to, that there's a pharmacogenetic test available and then they can, they can be ordered. And once the test is ordered, the data, uh, the, you know, once you run the test, we, we collect the data and we, uh, for all the genes and the data for all the genes on the panel are reported in APEX and are in the patient's profile and can be used for all, for prescribing, if they're actionable, for prescribing all these medications that you see on this particular, in this particular table. And, and uh, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, I mentioned about 14,000 patients, uh, and over 14,000 pediatrics or less than 21 years of age. I've highlighted the drugs on this uh, list uh, that, in brown, these are the ones that were prescribed to, uh, to, to, to pediatric patients, to that particular age group. So not every medication was prescribed, but um, uh, quite a few of these medications were prescribed to, uh, to pediatrics. So genetics can uh, be used in, in these kind of scenarios. Um, so mentioned we have 15 pretest alerts to inform the prescribers that there's a, a medication that uh, they're being, that's being prescribed that has genetic uh, drug gene interaction and they can, so they can choose to order the genetic test. And then once the test is done, these, we have these post-test alerts that fire uh, whenever there's an actionable phenotype for all 56 medications. And this is what these look like in the system. So provider uh, provides uh, providers like if you're ordering simvastatin, for example, you see a pretest alert that fires like this. Um, so um, this is the provider in this case ordering simvastatin. The alert fires, and it, it, it provides the uh, the provider with the option of ordering pharmacogenetic tests. You can, if you click order, then you can just kind of click on the accept button and move on. But if you decide not to order, which is fine. Um, you have to select one of the reasons for why you're not ordering it. 
By, by the way, has anyone in this room seen any of these pretest alerts? I'm curious. Nobody. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, but uh, you know, there's a, you know, we have this language that's up there, uh, uh, and I wanted to highlight this. Necessary medication obviously should not be withheld while waiting for a genetic test result. Um, so once you click on the order on the button you'd like to order, then you, this next window opens up, and you have to select primary indication for ordering. And that, when you click in there, it just lists the drugs. The 56 drugs that we have in there are listed. You have to select the drug, um, and then that uh, uh, you know, and select the drug and sign the order, and that's it. So along with the order. Uh, we, for the PGX uh, or test order, a blood draw order also is, is sent for the, for the patient. And so you sign the order. Uh, and then the next step is that uh, where you're asked to uh, provide a diagnosis for the reason. So this is, uh, these are all for billing purposes. So we collect the CPT code that's associated with the drug gene test and along with the ICD-10 code that's generated from here to, to, to you know, create our billing. Uh, so it's important to get the right diagnosis for this. So this example was um, simvastatin. So hyperlipidemia is an appropriate uh, indication for that. Um, now, in the inpatient setting, uh, the order uh, once the test is ordered, a pharmacist who is validating uh, the, uh, the you know he's reviewing the orders um, uh, in their work queue. They can see a message like what you're seeing in here. It says, uh, it says there's a single order uh, message in there. That means that for in this instant, voriconazole, the physician has ordered voriconazole, and they, uh, the, the language single order in there indicates to the pharmacist that a pharmacogenetic test has been ordered. So it's really neat that this system communicates with the other providers so that they know that this action has been taken. So, the test is done. Um, so now we move into the, uh, those are the pre-test stuff. So now we move into the post-test alert scenario. So these post-test alerts that fire, these represent, uh, they deliver this unedited CPIC FDA recommendations. Uh, so the, the recommendations that you see in there are not uh, something that we write. This is, they come in from CPIC or FDA. Uh, these post-test alerts will, will be presented as medication interaction warning. And I'll show you an example of that. They appear in that medication interaction warning, like drug-drug interaction or drug condition interaction, each time a clinician clicks sign for a medication order with a relevant drug interaction for that patient. All medication ordering clinicians, no matter if they're using treatment plan, therapy plan, or manage orders for order entry and signing, see the same alert at the same point in their workflow. Clinicians not involved in ordering, signing of medication or orders can also see the same alert in the med interaction warning window when releasing orders and or verifying orders, like pharmacists, as I showed you. And this is, as, again, as an example of looking at all of that. So if this is a, a physician is trying to order iron or TCAN in this case for a patient who has a UGT1A1 poor metabolizer. So when they're ordering it, you see the top window opens up and, uh, you know, tells them that, you know, you need to make it, uh, you know, consider adjusting the dose because of the phenotype um, and a clinician can decide um, an override reason um, uh, if, if they wish to override it. Um, uh, or and, and then that reason gets documented, but you don't have to. We're encouraged that you do that because we are tracking this and we, the, you know, it, it helps us optimize this, but you don't really have to select a reason to override. You can just click override and accept and it will allow you to move on. But what happens is that now, uh, if let's say at a later date, someone else is interacting with that particular order, the, you know, they will see that this order was last overridden by, uh, you know, by the person. And if they provided a reason for override, it was there. So that information kind of gets documented. And, uh, and you, you, as a provider, you know that somebody has looked at this before you, uh, when you're looking at this particular order. One of the downfall, downside of our system is that dosing, it does not, it's not smart enough to detect dose. So for example, if you decrease the dose of iron or TCAN, it's been adjusted based on genetics, that, you know, the alert will fire again. And so, um, so, uh, so um, uh, knowing that someone has looked at this and 
acted on it and prescribed it, I think it's it's helpful. Um, so, um, and then a pharmacist that, who's verifying this order uh, can also see in their work queue either by clicking on the interaction or they can see the pharmacogenetic warning box in here, and they it will open up. And they'll see, oh, somebody has looked at this, Dr. So-and-so overrode it, interacted with this. So they know that someone has to, has thought about this. So that, that communication is very important. These alerts that we have, they were uh, initially draft. I, I, I did the first draft of all the medication alerts that are in the system. There were about uh, 348 so of these types of alerts in the system for all of these drugs. But um, I reached out to uh, uh, clinicians across all of these specialties to have them look at them and kind of sign off and say, yes, I agree with the language that's in there. So um, the point is that these alerts have been reviewed by someone other than just one person and me. Um, um, two ways to order the test. I talked about the BPA firing and you can order the test, but you can also order the test uh, by going to order activity, open the orders and type any of these pharmacogenetics, PGX, PG panel, any of these words, you know, the test, you, know, you, can, you, can, uh, you can find the test and select it and order it in that way. Uh, the, so the test is available for inpatient, outpatient. The sample that we use is blood primarily. Buckle swab is only reserved for bone marrow transplant. The lab is the UCSF Genomic Medicine Lab, which, pro which processes and genotypes the sample. It's located in Mount Zion. The, the array that we use is called a pharmacoscan array, and the turnaround time is two weeks from the time of receipt of the sample. And the PGX test results are in patients. They come in into patients' apex profile under, in a genomics filter under labs, and a report is created for the patient in my chart for them to see. Um, this pipeline, this is the, our, uh, you know, uh, this is our automated clinical decision support uh, pipeline that start with ordering, placing the order in Apex and translate and transferring that information through various steps and, and bringing you back into the Apex. You know, we spent considerable amount of time, obviously, developing this particular pipeline. We're particularly, we're very proud of it. It works very nicely. Uh, right now for us, and uh, um, you know, uh, and so it's, it's it's really great. We spend a lot of time doing that. Um, in Apex, um, uh, under genomic indicators, you'll see all the uh, the results of the tests that are kind of listed for various genes. On that, uh, on on the chevrons that are inside, if you click on them, you get more information. And there's also a built-in PDF in there that is generated for every test. You can open that and look at more detail. The, uh, the genotypes and the associated phenotype for, for the medications. And that particular PDF report is the one that makes it in, in my chart and a physician uh, or a patient can access it. Um, um, other resources for clinicians, so we, or education is an important component. So we organize education tip sheet and training material for clinicians. In these material, there are actually short YouTube videos um, that, you, that CPIC had created. There are links in there that you can click on and, you know, for a specific drug that's of interest to you, and you can watch the video. Uh, these material were sent to all clinicians in an announcement from UCSF leadership um, uh, on May 9th. Um, and then uh, we have, a, there's a PGA consult service that you can access and you can reach uh, on Volt. Uh, you can just search for pharmacogenetics consult. You should be able to find that. And you can, if you have questions, please put them in that and you'll get an answer. And based on uh, some demand that we've had, you know, after the, uh, uh, the, the media coverage of this, we've had uh, people in the community reaching out to the adult genetics service asking for to meet with somebody to talk about their genetics, the pharmacogenetics. Uh, so we've started a little adult genetics, and uh, pharmacogenetics clinic and then the adult genetics. And I've had uh, two, uh, two meetings so far. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, if there are patients that are interested, obviously that's also, that can be a resource <laughs> or patient can be referred to that. Um, there are other educational material that are out there. Um, uh, NHGRI has a good source and also Genome Ed. And I'll tell you a little more about Genome Ed. Genome Ed offers online repository of genomics educational material. It's peer reviewed, uh, collection of genetic material content for 
counselors, nurses, pharmacists, physician assistants, and physicians. And it has a professional editorial board that curates all the resources and the resources are mapped to discipline specific genomic competencies. And you can go to the top genome ad resource page and you can search by topic. So there is, um, you know, you can select the topic uh, uh, in, in this particular like drop down menu. And, you know, pharmacogenetics is one of those topics. The resources, uh, resource format, you can choose the type of format that uh, is interesting to you. And then whether you want it as a CE format or not. Can select that and you'll get a list of these items. And also uh, um, uh, you can find under, uh, under genome.gov, there is a list of competency, genomic uh, competencies published for different disciplines. Um, I think they're really helpful to kind of review as well if you so choose to. Um, who pays? That's a big question. UCSF will, uh, you know, for this uh, service will build the insurance. Uh, outside copay, we expect that the patient should not be responsible for balance. And this is based on uh, the fact we have a UCSF 500 test. We do about 5,000 tests a year. UCSF collects what the insurance pays and doesn't pursue the patients for the remaining balance. We've done um, close to about 400 pharmacogenetic tests so far. We haven't had any complaints from anyone related to billing, but we're monitoring this closely. We build the insurance only once for the drug gene pair that initiated the PGX testing. All future uses of the data is free to the patient and insurer, so it's a one-time charge. Um, there is a bill uh, uh, in the assembly in California legislature um, uh, that was introduced earlier this year um, uh, by Assemblyman David Alvarez. It's called Path for All Act. It's an AB 425. And if and right now it, it has passed the assembly and this, uh, the, the the senate, and it's in front of the governor. So if governor signs it, then PGX, then Medi-Cal will cover uh, pay for pharmacogenetic testing, which is a huge uh, a huge benefit to have. And I had the opportunity to uh, to appear in front of the uh, assembly health uh, committee and testify on behalf of uh, in support of this particular bill earlier this year. In terms of variant reporting, we, um, you know, we have a list of genes that you saw. We, uh, we only report actionable variants. Variants of unknown or uncertain functions are filtered out. Um, so, uh, and, uh, uh, so um, because we don't have reference samples for all the variants that we'd like to report, sometimes you get a variant that we'd like to report, but it hasn't been validated. And when that happens, we use Sanger sequencing to, um, to validate that. So that adds a couple more weeks before we can turn the results and turn the results back uh, to, the, to the ordering provider. And I, so I share that because you know, our turnaround time is two weeks, but when those incidences happen, then the turnaround gets delayed. And in fact, the CYP2C19 star 16 variant that you see here has recently uh, been observed in a patient and we validated it using Sanger sequencing. Um, in terms of for patient, uh, patient consent is not required, but providers should discuss the test and document discussion and patient approval. This assay is not used for any disease diagnostic purposes. Patients are provided educational content as well, and patients can access the results of their PGX testing in my chart. And so I want to share with you some numbers, um, uh, and these are uh, numbers from July 24th. Um, so number of or tests that uh, orders that were completed at that time were like 213. Um, and, and these were 213 uh, tests that were ordered out of 5,990 pretest alerts that were fired. So that's, um, that's a huge number. So this is like, again, we have remember 15 drugs that fire a pretest alert. So for these 15 drugs, 5,990 alerts were fired and out of those, uh, they resulted in 213 orders for the test. The ordering grade was 2.9%. The pre these, uh, these 5,990 were fired through 3,005 unique patients. Um, and then each patient on average received like two different alerts. Number of outpatient uh, reimbursements. So we don't really worry about the inpatient, it's the outpatient that's a concern. So we had, um, at that point, when we looked at, there were 39 um, um, uh, outpatient cases that were completed. 
For 22 out of those 39, there was some money that came back to UCSF when the bill was sent. Um, so like I said, we haven't had any complaints yet from anyone. Um, um, and then in terms of pretest alerts, um, um, uh, you know, these pretest alerts were fired. You can see the number of uh, which drugs and how many of these pretest alerts were fired for. TAC is by far the highest one. And most of these are inpatient and they fire uh, because TAC is ordered daily. Um, and so, um, you know, if someone else, if, you know, it's being ordered daily, it's, the alert is getting triggered. But the way the alert is programmed is that it will fire one time per patient, per provider, per drug gene pair. So if you are ordering tecrolimus today for a patient, you see the alert and you override it, you will never, ever, ever see that alert for that drug gene pair for that patient ever. Like if the patient comes 10 years from now, that alert should not fire for you. Um, and so that's, the, you know, you have that one opportunity it's presented again to, to minimize alert burden. Uh, but still, TAC is ordered by different people, and so these alerts pile up. And then in this slide, this is a, an interesting slide for me because we have 15 drugs that have pretest alerts. Out of those 15, 14 were fired. One of the drugs was not, it just it wasn't ordered. Some of these drugs aren't used. Um, I think Pemazide is the drug, it was just not ordered. And then for out of those 14 that were fired, seven of those resulted in an order. So the, these are the red ones that are highlighted. But it's interesting to me, you have all these drugs that are black, uh, they're not highlighted in red. Uh, clinicians ordered a pharmacogenetic test for all of these other drugs. So, which is great, you know, I love seeing that. Um, so, um, kind of coming to the end. So some of the advantages of this test is that it's a UCSF team that has developed this in-house test for this, uh, that has a strong emphasis on developing an extensive, customized, it has a robust pipeline and analysis processes with clinical input. This is a one-time test. Once you complete it, the data can be used for future encounter. Your gene of interest can be in investigated further. In fact, I've had one question so far where somebody, uh, you know, we collect a lot of data, someone comes back and says, oh, can you tell me about some of these other SNPs that, that are not, we're not reporting on. So we, we do not have a lot, but we're only reporting the actionable variants. All billing is handled through APEX. Only patient's insurance is billed for this service. We don't expect the patient uh, to receive a bill. Um, and pharmacogenetics, uh, you know, and, and that's important. You know, we really want to not make cost a barrier. Cost has been a barrier for implementing pharmacogenetics forever. And um, so, um, uh, so it's, we're trying very hard to remove that as a barrier. Uh, pharmacogenetics, uh, you know, I really think it can make care safer, more effective, and hopefully more affordable by helping tailor patients' medication and therapies. So I am here speaking, but uh, I'm the one person, I'm, uh, but this was the work and effort of many, many people. Uh, this project was under the leadership of Russ Kuchina. He's our chief health informatic officer and Alex Reykovic. He's chief genomic officer, my department chair, Lisa Kroon, who is the assistant chief pharmacy uh, uh, officer. And then Desi Kodes, who is our chief pharmacy um, 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 so, but she's the chief pharmacy officer, uh, but the E, there's an E in there. Uh, but uh, we had uh, um, uh, people, we have many, many people across different expertise that uh, have contributed to the project. I'm most grateful to the UCSF BPA reviewers. We had 38 physicians and pharmacists that really spent time looking at each one of these alerts and um, and um, and contributed to making sure that the alerts, the language was accurate, was helpful, and I'll stop there. And thank you for your time and attention. Sorry, I was coughing. If you have any questions, um, I don't think I have another slide. Yeah, my email is bonnie.tamras at ucsf.edu. Feel free to reach out to me. I have lots of numbers, lots of stuff. Happy to help. I just want to see this used. I want to help you use this information. And um, there's a lot of help that's available for you, um, you know, when you're thinking about imp implementing this in your practice. So, thank you.
Thank you, Bobby. That was sure. really great. A huge amount of work. Thank you. And I'm sure it will be very effective for patient care. Just the one question that uh, comes to mind. How long do you think it'll be before whole genome sequences becomes just part of routine? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Uh, I I want to I I hesitate to guess. You know, pharma genetic. You know, when human genome was was sequenced in 2003, there were all kinds of projections were made. We thought that you know we'd solved many many of these things, uh, but 20 years have gone by and we're just scratching the surface of a lot of this. I think the cost clearly the cost of human genome sequencing have dropped tremendously. Um, um, if Alex was here, Alex would say, you know, I want every person that walks into UCSF to be sequenced, <laughs> um, you know, because you do it one time and you save it and you'll have it uh, for all future uses, but it's, it's going to take some time. I don't, it's, it's hard to say, but genotyping is accessible. It's not expensive, honestly, the sequencing is, where, you know, there's a lot of, it's expensive to do and data analysis is expensive, whereas genotyping, you know, you've selected uh, a few hundred SNPs, um, so it's, it's much more manageable and it's, it's a low hanging fruit that you can- How much does one, one test cost, actual cost? Cost to run? Um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's under $400, I'll, I'll say it down. Uh, the, the cost of that, those, you know, the cost of reagents and chip is, uh, it's, it's not very much, uh, but there's, there are other costs that are associated with that, but um, that's what it is. Other questions? Yes. Oh, will the okay? So uh, there's a question in the chat. Thank you. Will the insurance be billed, or is it covered by UCSF? So we build the insurance, uh, and if we get reimbursed, uh, that's great. But if we do not, the, the goal is not to pass any bill to the patient. So nothing should make it to the patient. If it does, we'd like to know. Um, that's our approach. You know, we try very hard to not make cost a barrier. More chat? That's it. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.